Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a travel agent and a customer who needs to book a hotel for a group visit. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello Elite Travel, this is Emily speaking. How may I assist you today? Hi, I have a group visit to plan and I wonder whether you could help me decide on which hotel to book. I've narrowed it down to either the Winchester, the Royal Hotel, or the Star Hotel. I'm wondering if you have a recommendation. I would be happy to help. Those three are excellent choices. If everyone is booking hotel rooms independently, an easy way to do it is online booking. The Star Hotel offers online bookings at no additional charge. It sounds fine. Yeah, and you can even book the gorgeous Sea View rooms if you act quickly. I'll consider that. It would be great since we are mostly first-time visitors to the area to get a nice view of the water. Now, are there handicap accessible rooms? Yes, all three options have access for the physically disabled. Great. I should also mention that we'll be on a tight schedule, so we won't have much time to go out for meals. Which of these hotels serve food? There is a limited continental breakfast menu at the Star and at the Winchester. For a full restaurant and room service, the Royal Hotel is your best bet. Oh, wonderful. Could you tell me more about the restaurant? Absolutely. In the morning, there is a gourmet buffet, or a la carte item, and after 11 a.m., lunch is served in the dining room. Dinners are in a nice, low-key, but high-quality setting in the hotel's private dining room and Fridays feature the house jazz band. How lovely. Is there a group discount? No, sorry, not at the Royal Hotel. Let me check on the others, though. Could I place you on hold for just a second? Sure, thanks. It looks like there is one at the Winchester. 15% off when you book eight or more rooms. Really? Sold. We'll book at the Winchester. Wait, is it suitable for children, though? We'll have a few little ones in our group, and it would be great to have a way to keep them occupied. Yes, in fact, it has a play place that kids just love, with slides and swings and everything. Definitely a good hotel to bring the kids. OK, great. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. So now I know where we'll be staying. What next? Should I go ahead and book transportation and assign rooms and everything? Well, for now, there are only a few things for you to take care of. We will hold a block of rooms for you as soon as you send a deposit. I recommend booking as soon as possible, so you probably want to send the invitations as soon as you know how many rooms to hold. All right. OK, I'll send the invitations and put down the deposit. Is there anything else I should take care of? Great. And don't worry about this now, but sometime before you arrive, do let us know if you'll be requiring our transport service to and from the airport. I'll make sure to let you know. Does that incur a service charge, or perhaps a tip, or some presents to show our gratitude for the personal car service? Oh, don't worry about it. It is a free service. So if you would like to tip, you are welcome to do so. But hotel drivers do not accept gifts. Thanks for your help. My pleasure. Enjoy your stay at the Winchester. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of a radio program in which the manager of the Apollo Leisure Center is interviewed about the center. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen to the first part of the interview, and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Next, I'd like to welcome Carol Brown, manager of the Apollo Leisure Center. Carol, welcome. Thank you. Now, Carol, the Apollo seems a familiar sight, but how long has it actually been here? Well, we started negotiations to take over the previous Active Life Centre that used to occupy the premises、mm -hmm. in two thousand, and planned to open in two thousand and one, although the usual delays meant it was two thousand and two before we were up and running.、Mm. And do you have quite a mix of members, or are you focused on certain groups? It's pretty broad, actually. There are something like two hundred adult members, so that's our biggest group. But we also have as many as a hundred youth members, together with about fifty family group members. And I think we'll see that section growing to a hundred over the next couple of years. Healthy numbers. Yes, and we'll be developing the centre to make it even more attractive. We're hoping eventually to build in a rock climbing wall, which would make a useful addition. We've already opened our swimming pool, which is hugely popular, and we'll have a massage room open within twelve months. Now I understand you have different categories of membership. Yes, to suit every pocket. Blue membership includes all facilities for the member and a guest at all times, which is good for people with unpredictable timetables. If you can make it during daytime hours, red membership gives you excellent returns for your fee. As for only half price, you can use all the facilities during the day, and they're actually less crowded then. Green membership is designed for people who are only able to come infrequently. And so, of course, costs less. And there are chances to socialise. Oh, certainly! Our cafe is very popular and is a nice place to wind down and chat after working out or whatever. In fact, while it used to shut at eight, we've extended that to nine now, with last orders taken at eight thirty. It serves a whole range of food and drink.、Mm. So, if someone wants to join, what do they do? Come and see us.、Mm. We'll give you all the details. The induction process takes about an hour and a quarter, which includes three quarters of an hour on average with a personal trainer, and something like half an hour being shown round the different facilities. So we'd be well looked after. Definitely. Now you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now listen to the rest of the interview, and answer questions seventeen to twenty. Okay, now Carol, can you give us some idea of what we could expect to get as members of Apollo? Sure. Well, let's take next Monday as an example.、Mm -hmm. The early evening would begin with the program of classes. Of course, members would also be at liberty to do their own thing. I'm just talking about the listed classes that we'll be offering.、Uh -huh. So let's say you're free to turn up at 4 p.m. You could spend an hour in a class that we call gentle exercise. This isn't a hard workout as you might be imagining it, but a session designed for those who perhaps are not used to rigorous classes and would like something to ease them in. Right. The next thing on offer will be starting at five, and again it'll last for an hour. In contrast, this is what we simply call weightlifting. 
It's certainly not for softies, but this strenuous session is, of course, carefully monitored and we wouldn't let anyone do anything silly. Oh, well, that's reassuring. And then, kicking off at quarter past six, you'll be welcome at a class aimed at promoting better lifestyles, which we run under the banner of healthy living. We'll give you all sorts of useful advice about just living better. Oh, sounds easier than working out. And probably at least as important. And rounds the evening off nicely. Oh, no, we still have one more offering. Oh. These days, so many people are working, frankly, more than they should be. And we try to combat the stress that that creates by encouraging those who can to take part in the class we call relaxation. You can learn lots of helpful techniques for staying calm when you think everything's going terribly. Now you're talking. So we'll see you on Monday. Ah, now... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. And welcome to this morning's lecture on transport. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good morning, and welcome to this morning's lecture on transport. What I'll be doing today is comparing forms of transport in different countries to see how forms of transport are affected by factors such as geographical landscape and economic development. My focus will be on countries in South America, Europe and Asia. The first country I'd like to look at is Colombia, which is in South America. This is a country where geography plays an important role. Due to the huge amount of mountains and forests in this country, travelling by air is crucial. I don't know if many of you realise this fact, but Colombia was the first country to establish a commercial airline, and in so doing they made aviation history. Today, there are more than 400 airports in Colombia for domestic flights, which highlights the point I made earlier that air travel is a vital means of transport in this country. Colombia also has a road network of about 48,000 kilometres, linking Colombia to Venezuela and Ecuador. Transport by road is important for trade as well as tourism. Apart from this, there is also a railway system, but it is in need of modernisation. The other means of transport is by steamers, with the Magdalena being the main waterway. Now let's turn to Colombia's neighbour, Venezuela. Once again, we see that internal flights are an important means of transport, as like Colombia, Venezuela has remote areas where flying is the easiest means of travelling from A to B. Trains are not popular, and most of the railway lines are in the highlands, as this is where the iron ore mines are. Trains are an efficient means of transporting the iron ore from the mines to the factories. Thus we can see how transport and the economy are interrelated. Ships are also used extensively in this country, and there are many ports, the main seaports being Puerto Cabello and Guanta. Turning now to Europe. Belgium is a country that boasts one of the most compact railway systems worldwide. Inland waterways, or canals, are also an important means of transport, transporting both freight and people. Belgium also has the third largest seaport in the world, 
namely Antwerpen. Air travel is also important. Although this is not linked to geographical terrain, as is the case in the South American countries we've already looked at. Next, I'd like to look at the United Kingdom. Like Belgium, the UK has inland waterways around 4,000 kilometres, yet only about 17% of these are used for commercial transport. The main inland port is Manchester, and the chief seaport is London, with Southampton taking second place. Air travel is extensive in this country, and there are around 150 airports, the most famous being Heathrow. However, about 90% of passengers in the UK travel by road. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Finally, I'd like to look at two Asian countries. China is a country which reveals how geographical size affects transport development. Roads and railways are widely used, and this has led to a huge amount of bridges being built, such as the Yangtze Bridge, which is probably the most widely known. The Yangtze Bridge is 1.6 kilometres long and is built on two levels. The upper tier is for cars and pedestrians, while the lower is for trains. Railways are especially important, and over 80% of freight and passengers are transported by rail. With such a high proportion of people using trains, it is not surprising that governments in countries like China are prepared to invest in the railway system. Obviously, a fast and effective train service will encourage businesses and the general public to continue using it. The last country I'm going to mention is Japan, which has one of the most advanced transport systems in the world. The railway system is highly developed, and the Takedo Railway, connecting Tokyo and Osaka, has trains that can travel up to 250 kilometres per hour. Ships are also a vital means of transport in both international and domestic areas. To summarise, we can see that transport varies throughout the world, yet the importance of transport networks, be they air, sea, rail or road, cannot be underestimated. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear someone talking about art. Look at questions 31 to 35. Listen to the first part and answer questions 31 to 35. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first in this year's series of public lectures offered by the Art Gallery. As Chief Curator of the Gallery, I was given the honour of presenting the first lecture, and let me tell you, I had a difficult time deciding what to talk about tonight. Being the curator, I naturally know just about everything that's in this gallery. But I wanted to choose an artist who has a wide appeal. 
That seems only fair, yes? But I didn't want to talk about someone so well known that anything I said would be familiar. I wanted someone modern. My personal preference is for modern art. But again, I wanted to choose someone who had the potential to appeal to all art lovers, whether they're attracted to traditional forms, impressionism, surrealism, or what have you. So, Having spent the last five years as a visiting professor in Barcelona, it's not surprising that I finally chose to talk about one of the greatest Catalan artists, one whose work is likely to be familiar to many of you, Juan Miro. Look at this. And this. And this. Ring any bells? Miro's most famous and most widely reproduced works tend to be like this. Bright primary colours with lots of asymmetrical forms. He painted on large canvases, larger than himself quite often, and his paintings depicted birds, trees, flowers and other features of the natural world. But Miro produced a great variety of work and it's about some of his lesser-known paintings that I would like to speak this evening. Miro was born in Barcelona in 1893, the son of a goldsmith. He began to show talent very early, and in 1926 went to Paris, where he was drawn to the Surrealists of Montparnasse. He did not define himself as a Surrealist, however, he preferred to stay free to experiment with other artistic styles as he wished. Miro had an intense dislike of much of the painting and many of the painters he knew. He wished to do something totally different, to express his contempt for bourgeois art. And yet, ironically, Miro's success has made his works much in demand among art collectors of the world. But we can't really talk about the artist without looking at his art. And that's what I'd like to do now. To take a look at just a few of Miro's works and think about what it is that makes them special. Special to me and to a great number of people who flock every day to the Miro Foundation in Barcelona. Now look at questions 36 to 40. As the lecture continues, answer questions 36 to 40. Let's start with this. One of Miro's best known and brightest works, Woman and Bird. A sculpture created in 1982. It is on display in a park in Barcelona, often known as the Juan Miro Park. A huge sculpture towering up into the sky. It reflects Miro's eternal interest in these themes, as well as his more technical interest in materials. This sculpture is covered in mosaic, which gives it a naive and cheerful appearance. It is interesting that this sculpture was completed in 1982, just a year before Miro's death. I think it shows that, towards the end, he was feeling as playful as a young man. And I think he wanted to share this playfulness in a park on such a big, very public scale. And now, another representation of a woman, this time just called Woman. This was painted in 1976, a late work for Miro, and is a work we often see reproduced or on sale as postcards or posters in gallery shops around the world. So why is it so popular? I think the use of colour has something to do with it. People respond to these rounded shapes filled with primary colours, especially on a large canvas like this. Also, the fact that, 
while it is rather surreal, it is still possible to recognise the form of a woman and to see it as a sympathetic representation. It's a bold, bright painting, and I think that it awakens a reaction in many of us. And finally, something quite different, though still a woman. A harsh, even violent work that was completed in 1939, at a time when Miro was greatly influenced by events of the Civil War in Spain. It's titled Seated Woman 2, but it can be hard to find the woman here, as she's been transformed into a rather horrendous creature. So is that how Miro viewed women? As grotesque? Not at all. This picture can also be seen as strong, with a huge base and solid shoulders to support those who depend on her. In this painting, her arms and neck seem to grow as vegetation out of her shoulders, representing woman as a fertile ground, perhaps. We also see here the fish and birds, the moon and stars, so typical of Miro's work making her a creature of nature and of the heavens as well. And that's all we have time for this evening, I'm afraid. I hope that you've enjoyed this brief look at Miro's work and that you will enjoy the other lectures that follow this one. Thank you and good night. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.